This morning, nearly 7,000 people in New York City have died from coronavirus. There are also more than 4,000 probable deaths here from the virus. The virus is killing and infecting black and Latino communities at a much higher rate than others. And for people who are poor, the double whammy of losing their jobs and getting sick is devastating. Joining us now is New York Assemblyman Michael Blake. He represents the Bronx, one of New York's five boroughs. Assemblyman Blake, great to have you this morning. You know, we've all become so painfully aware of the disproportionate impact that the coronavirus is having on communities of color, but I'm not sure that our viewers know that the Bronx, the district where you're from and that you represent, is the poorest congressional district in the country. And so what does coronavirus look like in the Bronx? Well, Allison, first of all, uh, thank you and, and respect to you and all women journalists around the country, around the world, uh, for all that you do. Uh, there was a pandemic of poverty and institutionalized racism before coronavirus hit our shore. Uh, and what we have to do now is find and fund a cure for both. You know, it has been challenging, uh, to say the least, uh, for what we've been watching on the ground, because we've seen communities who always come together, uh, but still have so much challenges um, themselves. And what do I mean by that? This is everything from uh, the family, uh, that is of the essential worker, and God bless our essential workers, whether if you're a healthcare hero or a grocery worker, uh, someone at the airport, someone at a restaurant. Uh, but when you leave and you have two children at home, what happens to the child for remote learning? Mm. Uh, what happens to the small businesses that has not had the support uh, because the federal government has not helped us fast enough? What happens to the person that needs food to eat? And that's why we partner with World Central Kitchen and Bistro and so many places. Yeah. Uh, and so, Allison, the Bronx has been hit hard, but we understand uh, you know, in the Bronx, things happen. Uh, and we're going to find a way to overcome these challenges due, due to coronavirus. Well, let's dive into that a little bit, because what is happening for children in the Bronx? Uh, if they if they don't have access to a laptop, how are they doing remote learning and how are they being fed right now? So for education, obviously, we have to figure out a, a faster way to get devices out to everyone. Uh, we have been uh, incredibly frustrated by the delay. Uh, part of it, unfortunately, is because uh, workers that were doing the processing delivery became ill. Uh, but then we have to still figure this out. And so uh, if you don't have a laptop or tablet as of yet, uh, they're essentially giving you paper while you go home to complete the assignments. Uh, but the challenge, Allison, is that we are currently only tracking engagement and not true attendance and progress. We always tell people there's a difference between activity and progress. Mm -hmm. So if we made sure that the child has a tablet in their book bag, rather than trying to arrest them for a dime bag, things would be better and be there'll be better priorities here. Uh, and so within that, there's also the food challenges. Uh, and so we are giving out 17,000 meals a day in the Bronx uh, due to our partnership with World Central Kitchen, uh, with Here to Here, Dream Yard, Bistro, Bronx Draft House, Bricks and Hops, so many different restaurants, Mont Haven Bar and Grill. We've uh, surpassed 325,000 meals we've given out since March 17th, mm. but we have to keep going. Uh, and so we encourage everyone in the Bronx uh, to obviously follow us at MR Mike Blake or follow WC Kitchen and, and God bless Chef Jose Andres so we can get food out to everyone. Yeah. And also when it comes to education, going back to that, we're going to get tablets out through Dream Yard. Uh, through more than 700 Chromebooks that have been purchased for our Bronx students. That's a that's a Herculean effort that you are engaged in. Let's talk about the two trillion dollars of stimulus funds. So the relief, the financial relief from the federal government that is supposed to be going out to people, you know, in dire situations. Why isn't that trickling down to the Bronx? Well, unfortunately, Allison, it's not trickling down because I don't think Donald Trump cares if black and brown people die and doesn't care if black and brown businesses die. Uh, and when you think about the Triple P program, uh, it, it has not worked at all significantly on the ground. Uh, and thank God for partners like Michael Brady at the Third Avenue Bid, uh, for Demetrius Janulius at Spring Bank. We've been able to find other creative ways on the ground. Uh, Allison, we've launched the Bronx Community Relief Effort to help with this as well. Uh, eight specific verticals led by Derek Lewis, Judy Diamond Foundation, and so many others, so that we can help our small businesses who are not being assisted. But just explain, and when people have but, asked but, but us, Mr. Blake, just, sorry to interrupt, but just explain that to us. I mean, I understand that you're relying on philanthropy. And again, thank God for these folks who are giving money directly to the Bronx. But why wouldn't the federal dollars make it to the Bronx? Just help us understand that disconnect. 
Absolutely. So number one, uh, when you have a cash economy, uh, whether if you're at a restaurant, a barbershop, or a beauty salon, uh, to then tell someone that everyone has to sign up as a 1099 contractor is unrealistic. Uh, you have an immigrant community uh, that has not been able to be engaged, and they're afraid of the government, and therefore those businesses are not able to come online. The larger banks, through a first-come, first-serve approach, uh, did not engage with us on the ground at all, and it was not sufficient technology to help our smaller banks get the support to be able to process the loan applications. When only 70 applications were approved in the Bronx when there's more than 23,000, it demonstrates the broader problem. Uh, it's the reason why Natalie Molina Nino and I co-authored an op-ed in Newsweek to say that the next CARES Act can either be a lifeline or an assault on black and brown businesses. And so we have to make sure that we partner financial technology companies with the community development financial institutions so that the next bill actually provides relief on the way it's needed. Yeah. Uh, what's happening right now, Donald Trump is not working, and our black and brown businesses are on the verge of extinction in the Bronx and so many communities of color if we don't resolve this immediately. Well, Assemblyman Michael Blake, thank you for sounding the alarm for us and explaining um, how your community feels forgotten during all of this. We really appreciate talking to you. Thank you, Allison. John. So we want to take a moment to remember some of the people lost to coronavirus. Billy Birmingham was an EMT in Kansas City since 1998. He is the first city employee to succumb to the virus. The city's firefighter fountain and memorial was turned on early this week in Birmingham's honor. He was 69. He had seven kids, more than a dozen grandchildren and great-grandchildren. David Shingledecker was just 49 years old. He loved to fish and be around family. His daughter says he was initially turned away for treatment. Eventually, he was, was put on a breathing machine. His organs started shutting down and his heart just gave out. David's widow, Juanita, is still battling the virus from a medically induced coma. And Douglas Childs leaves behind a wife and two sons. He was a beloved member of the Bedford, New York community, managing a hardware store. And I can tell you from personal experience, he was delightful. Always smiling, always helpful. Never made you feel silly or incompetent, even when you were asking something silly or incompetent. The store says the outpouring of love and memories is a true testimony to his sincerity, his authenticity, and the relationships he made with so many. His big smile and welcoming heart will be sorely missed. Douglas Childs made things better. We'll be right back. America's oldest lighthouse has weathered many storms seeing the break in the clouds before anyone else.